I gave that to John. John's going to be right. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for bearing with us. Uh, begins this way. Adequate notice of the December the 14th, 2017 meeting has been provided in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act uh, by posting written notice and agenda of the meeting on this bulletin board in the municipal building, uh, 1000 Route 10, Township of Hanover, by hand delivering, mailing, or faxing such notice and agenda to the following newspapers, Morris County's Daily Record, the Star Ledger, and the Hanover Eagle, and by filing same with the Township Clerk. And I have a roll call. Well, on roll call, Committeeman Gallagher. Here. Committeeman Ferramosca. Here. Committeeman Bruno. Here. Committeeman Capola. Here. And Mayor Francioli. Here. Five members in attendance, sir. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, will you all please rise, those that may, and join us in an open prayer and our Pledge of Allegiance. John, you would like to? Almighty God, we ask that you bless this governing body with an abundance of wisdom and understanding so that every deliberation will result in actions which will promote the common good and the general welfare for all of the people of Hanover Township. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Uh, we have a very big attendance tonight. And uh, it is the honor of this uh, township committee tonight to recognize some individuals from our community and from our township. What you see up on that screen tonight, for those uh, who have not seen this before, and I doubt that there's very many that have not seen this before, uh, this is Billy's Red Room, Billy and Madeline's Red Room, uh, a historic piece of Hanover Township uh, that has been there and serviced our community. It's been friends to our community. It's serviced our community for countless years. Uh, November the 27th, in a tragic fire, we lost Billy's Red Room. And thankfully, thankfully, we had no loss of life. Uh, it was a tragic fire. Uh, at, uh, at the time of that fire, uh, we had so many responses uh, to our aid, uh, including some citizens that we're going to certainly recognize this evening. Before we, before we begin, I had asked uh, Christar Administrative Secretary here to get me some information and Chief Courtright was good enough uh, to give me some background information. Uh, a fire like this is not fought just by one fire company alone. Municipal aid certainly comes into this. And uh, the Chief was good enough to give me the following information and, I, and I'd like everyone to hear it uh, and hear what uh, all of, all of those that contributed to uh, uh, working this fire, controlling this fire, putting this fire out. Uh, and uh, the Chester and Rockaway Township Fire Departments responded and uh, replenished the air cylinders for, for the men. There were approximately 12 other departments that were dispatched to cover the towns that were on the scene fighting this fire. Par Troy EMS, along with multiple other EMS units. Atlantic Ambulance. Morris County's fire coordinator along with deputy fire coordinator, Hanover Township's Police Department, Hanover Township's Office of Emergency Management, and the County Office of Emergency Management. And the Chief's report is that follows, upon arrival uh, of Chief Courtright, civilians were in the process of rescuing Madeline Fernando from the second floor along with her dog. Billy was assisted from the kitchen and delivery entrance. This was completed at about 12.53. Four minutes after dispatch, all occupants were out of the building. There was heavy smoke coming from all floors of the building upon arrival of the fire department. Heavy smoke is an understatement. Uh, I received a phone call at that very same time uh, from uh, Dr. Mark. And, uh, and his concern was, and his phone call to me, was I aware of a fire on Persephone Road? And his concern certainly was for friends of his that were in there, Billy and, uh, Billy and Madeline. Uh, but to continue on with the, uh, with the chief's comments, crews established a primary and secondary water supply. An interior attack was made on the first floor of the building. At 1.30 p.m., crews were instructed to get out of the building. All members were accounted for. 
And at, at this time, they set up for an exterior attack with elevated master streams. Whippany and Cedar Knoll's departments remained on the scene till 7.44 that evening. The building suffered severe fire damage, smoke, water damage on all floors. There was no damage to the buildings next door, approximately 20 feet away from the fire. That's miraculous when one <laughs> considers the way this fire was. No injuries were reported to any firefighters, thankfully, and everyone on the scene went home safe. And that to that, Chief, and to the men of the department, our, our congratulations on this. But this evening, we have a special honor, and we would like to recognize some heroes of the day of our own hometown. Uh, and uh, we have for, uh, I'd like uh, both Kevin, uh, Kevin Borman, Andy, Archim, Frank DeMeo, Frankie, uh, to come forward, okay? And what we have, these gentlemen, before I have the honor of uh, awarding them these plaques, these, gen these gentlemen, having seen the early initiation of smoke from the house, came right to the house. Most of us would go the other way. Most of us would go the other way. They went to the fire. They went to the smoke. They went to the source. And when they got there and saw what was going on, they actually formed a human chain to get to the second floor. And Madeline, you were taken down from that, from that point and rescued. That rescue was absolutely miraculous, and we thank you. Everyone in Hanover Township sincerely thanks you for your bravery in that regard. Uh, we have for you a token of our appreciation. Um, I know uh, it's, it's not quite enough, but it's, it's certainly something that I hope that uh, you gentlemen will always uh, take a look at and, re and remind you of, uh, of a very brave deed and distinguished deed that you did this day. So I'd like to uh, present to Kevin and to Andy and to Frank. Okay. Jay, you want to help me here? Sure. Or what? Yeah. Okay. Gentlemen, come on over on this side. What do you mean? I hope you hang around my room. Well, it's seven foot. Wow. Real true act of bravery. Turn around and take a picture of me. Thank <laughs> you. 
Anybody up there? Okay, got everybody. I got I'm not moving. Don't move. Don't move. Here's the important question. When are you going up again with it? Uh, we don't know yet. Oh, <laughs> we, out of the ashes is going to come a new book. There you go. Uh, Okay, uh, Robert, one of my committee members would like to say a few words. Now that everybody's leaving, I uh, just wanted to add that I've known Kevin for about 15 years. We play basketball together. Ironically, the shorter guy is the uh, <laughs> basketball player. Um, but I, I believe all three are from town, but I happen to know Kevin. His grandmother's a Kaziski, a uh, longtime resident, probably in town since the 40s or 50s. Lives right up on Reynolds Avenue as the... Um, as the mayor said, you know, in this situation, um, I think it was Andy was taking the video, and you can see cars driving by, and people are kind of looking, and you see the smoke pouring out. But it was only these three, Frank and Andy and Kevin, who said, you know, I think maybe I should run toward the danger um, and see whether somebody might need help. And in fact, they really did. I think in this case, you wouldn't be understating the fact to say that they saved some lives. Um, and, and I just don't think you know how you're going to react in that situation. Um, but I think this is a perfect example of the right place at the right time. These guys were heroic. Um, there, were, there probably weren't more than a couple minutes to spare, right, Chief? I mean, if I uh, said two or three minutes one way or the other, this could have had a tragic ending. So um, for, for some Whippany residents, thankfully, again, right place at the right time, very heroic. Really appreciate those efforts, guys. So thanks again. Gentlemen, I was at a county meeting not too long ago, and uh, they too know of your heroic efforts, and I'm quite sure that very shortly you're going to hear from our County Board of Freeholders. So I'm, I'm certain that they'll want to recognize your efforts as well, and we all thank you very, very much. That's Hanover at its best, guys. Great things happening. Great happen. happen. Best. Very nice. Nice. Okay. Very good. Uh, at this time, all right, what we have, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Thanksgiving Day, Hanover Township had a, uh, an incident, uh, not only regarding loss of power in our community that evening, but the resulting loss of power uh, affected our water system uh, in that some pumping stations in a particular region of the area, being the Trailwoods, Country Woods in the local area, uh, were affected. Uh, by the uh, uh, the fact that the uh, water pumps generators uh, failed for a period of time and the uh, water system then had to go into uh, be tested. Uh, that sounds like an academic thing, test the water, etc. Uh, the testing was a, uh, an involved process taking up to 24 hours to see whether or not the stoppage of that water had developed any issues with bacteria or any other types of contaminations. Thankfully, the water system after the alert was, uh, was proven fine. Uh, the unfortunate portion of this all for our community, as Deputy Mayor Faramoska and I know, uh, made our Thanksgiving, was it was Thanksgiving Day. And um, several, uh, I think I'm probably safe in saying you a thousand or so members. 1,200. Yeah, 1,200. Okay. Billy, Madeline, take care. Have a good one. Thanks. Merry, nice. Merry Thanks. Christmas. Very good. Um, we, uh, John and I, uh, met with uh, Laura Cummings, the uh, director of our water company. Uh, immediately thereafter, the following morning, we had a, uh, uh, a session with them and learned a lot about uh, what the matter was. But uh, we asked uh, Laura to uh, come here tonight and to give us a presentation on what took place uh, that, uh, that created such a, a dilemma on, uh, of all days, Thanksgiving days for, for our people. So uh, 
Laura, I'm going to give you the floor, right? <clears throat> you want to take one of those microphones? How do you want to do? Is that probably you could take one of those right out of there. You could sit there, whatever you want to do. Well, that's no, not going to work. It's gotta no, stay. that's it's not going to work. All right, how does oh, it? Yeah. You, you take the whole system with you. <laughs> that works. Okay. How about if I just stand right here? Does yep. that work? Okay. Uh, good evening, and um, thank you for inviting me. Um, obviously, we regret the unfortunate circumstance that um, the issue uh, that occurred on Thanksgiving of all days of the year had on the customers of our system and the residents of Hanover. So what we're going to do tonight, uh, I'm going to co-present with Kenneth Crawford, our operations superintendent. I have also have our superintendent, Paul Kazakowitz, our licensed operator of record here, and Nick Bono, our IT manager. So we were all part of that emergency response team on the day of the event. So we're going to go over, as requested, the events that happened and explain in general why they happened. But we also want to talk about we have a solution to this issue um, that the irony of the whole thing is that as Kenneth was collecting data almost literally up to the day of before Thanksgiving practically that data was used to help us in making decisions about how we operate our system um, and then the irony uh, the next week after the event occurred or the week after we had a very experienced water resources engineer start with our company. So the convergence of the data that Kenneth has collected with his team and the experience from this other civil engineer, we've come up with a solution to eliminate this uh, single-ended issue with the system. So, but as requested, we're going to start out and talk about the um, event. And then uh, towards the end, we'll talk about the solution. So, do you want to stand over there and we'll switch? As everybody knows, the event was triggered by the outage, the power outage by JCPNL. They had an equipment failure causing the power failure across a good percentage, I guess, of Hanover. And subsequently, uh, next slide, please. That affected our facilities as well. We don't back up every facility with generator power because that's not necessary. We selectively um, station our emergency generators at specific stations. So the power outage affected two of our well stations and two of our pump stations. One of the pump stations that was affected included the, what we call our country wood pump station that provides water directly to what we refer to as a country wood service area. I believe you uh, the Trailwoods bone. Okay. Um, the puzzle piece that you see up here. Oh, this is a. Yeah. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, no, these are all worked out. Oh, okay. These are all worked out. So the the blue shaded area, the puzzle piece, is the country wood service gradient. The line that goes through that upper portion of it is the is the boundary, the municipal boundary between Morris Plains and Hanover. So just to put things in perspective. So that development was started construction back in the 60s, um, from what I understand, all the way through the 80s. And that's how that, those homes were, were built out in that gradient. The system was designed and approved by DEP at the onset to be what we call a direct pump system. And Kenneth is going to elaborate on what that exactly is later in the presentation. The authority upgraded that pump station sometime around 2006, added in new pumps. And again, that system was still approved as a direct pump station. Uh, there was no, there, back please, the, um, there was, there's still no storage in that station and it's not interconnected to any other service area. So it's solely dependent on that pump station and that generator and the utility power from JCPNL. So what happened on the night of the event, so when the power failed around two o'clock in the morning, that station, utility power was lost. The generator came on like it was supposed to come on. The generator ran for four hours. And right around six o'clock in the morning, the generator failed. There's an equipment failure that on a water coolant sensor on that diesel generator, causing that, alarm, that generator to fail, but the utility power wasn't back yet. 
So that's where the system, the direct pump system failed. We're no longer pumping water into that system during that time, and the pressure starts to drop. So the pressure, the system was restored back at 7.30 in the morning, and around 9.30 we started sending email messages. 10 o'clock we made uh, contact with Mr. Clerk, the OEM of Hanover, who assisted the authority in actually issuing a message to the residents of that service area via the Morse County uh, Citizen Alert System. And then simultaneous to that, we sent out our staff to hang uh, door tag notices at all of the customer stations or houses. When you lose pressure in a system, it would be the same thing as if we had a main break. You depressurize the system, you have the potential that you may have introduced a contaminant to the water system. It's a required boil water advisory. It's not optional at that point. We issue the boil water advisory. We took samples. The samples, you're measuring bacteria, so it's not an instantaneous uh, analysis, unfortunately. It takes 24 hours with the method that we use. Um, so those results came out roughly 24 hours after we sampled them. All the samples were clear. We were able to work with DEP to get the boil water rescinded that next day. Next slide, please. I got uh, Next slide there. Stop here for a commercial message. While we're waiting, can I just jump ahead? I assume you'll have a Q&A at some point. Can I just ask a couple questions? Would that be permissible? It's, it's basic stuff. Because I live up there. I live on Countrywood. Okay. So we were impa I was impacted. Um, just two questions. Number one, the, um, the notification that was put on the door, it said, you know, the homes in the following area will, are affected by this outage. Uh, see map attached. There was no map. Right, so that presented a little confusion. Um, okay, so you were gonna get to that. And then the other thing was the automated message was very difficult to understand. It's like houses in the following roads are impacted by this outage, and it was all done by computer, I assume. That's the um, Morris County Citizen Alert System. That's the Everbridge system. That okay. Is, so we learned a lot. Um, I asked them for comments back from the community. And we received a bunch of different messages. One, I guess, it, I don't know how it's actually populated with the list, but everybody, I heard that it would read the, the street name. If it was a drive, it would pronounce it as doctor. It and was, then the town was listed after every one of these, so you had to go through that. It was impossible to tell. And then there was no way to repeat it, and it's like, am I affected, am I not affected? You know, so, of yeah. course, you take caution anyway. But in this day and age, it seems like there might be a better way, a better system, almost to have, go back to somebody, a human being, actually reading the street names. Well, um, possibly. We, we've been working with um, the county OEM for that system because uh, my opinion is if we can't get that system to work well for the community, then the more we can use that as a common site to notify the citizens of true emergencies. Use it like it, it's, it's a it's a one-stop shopping for the community members to register because there's so many different ways that we want to register with our banks, with our schools, and all this. Um, so if we can work to make that work for all of us, if I get all of, uh, for example, if I used uh, one of the questions that came up, if I, if I were to notify 
the authority's account holders of a water emergency. The account holders may not be home at that time. Um, it's just the person that pays the bill. Right. The citizen alert system allows anybody that is in that household to register. So, for example, if you have a um, maybe a nanny or maybe someone for elder care or someone, if you work in a community but you don't live there, you can register for those alerts for what's specific to you. Or if your child, you work in Hanover and your child goes to school in another town, there are so many benefits to perfecting that system. I think the, the trick with the automation of the actual message because it's a computer voice. I don't know if there might be an option to actually do a recording in lieu of that possibly. It's probably I'm sure how it was we done work. in the old days, right? Back in the 80s or 90s, I would imagine. Yeah, I, um, I bet there is a way to do that better. So we got a lot of good feedback, we but I really want to keep In lieu of that, we, perhaps we a way to do it might be to just list the affected areas on a website. You know, yes, go to we, our website, here's the streets that are impacted. We do in that a, also, but true, then the other catch true, in a true emergency, oh, pardon yeah. me, in a true emergency, I will tell you this, in, in checking with our OEM director, with Tom Quirk, et cetera, and, mm -hmm. and by the way, uh, the moment this emergency took place, my phone rang. So, Tommy, thank you. Yes. Uh, I was right on top of it, and yes. uh, we got the process going immediately. We all went into action. If this was, and, and I don't know what a true emergency <coughs> is with a water system, but let me tell you this. This is a public utility, so let's get to the, let's cut to the quick. If it's a true emergency, our police department or other entities would be ringing doorbells in the affected neighborhoods and letting people know not to drink the water. All right, well, that, that didn't happen. We use these electronic systems. At some point, a notification did go out later in the day. Notices the went door out. tax, yes. R doorbells were wrong, notices were done, but I'm saying later in the day. This is Thanksgiving Day. You issue a water alert, don't use the water, and nobody knows what the issue is, whether it's a bacteria problem, whether it's some sort of a, was it a terrorist problem, et cetera. And um, so, you know, I, I have I an have issue with this, with, with this process, and I'm not saying it's exclusively the problem of the water company. It's something that we should be looking at. Uh, but somebody should be making the determination as to the, the, the extremity of the event. Am yes. I describing that right? And if it needs, household doorbells to be rung, and we have to know that. Right. I, there, there are two issues. One is perfecting the systems that we have to get the message out faster, more efficiently, but getting the message out quicker. Accurately. Was the, the issue. Yes. So we, and then I have a neighbor, just my third point, who was not on the, their, their street was not on the list, right, when the phone call came in, and then it turned out later on it was added. So they've been using the water thinking, oh, we're not affected. And in fact, now ultimately there was no bacteria, you know, it, was, it had a happy ending, but in that particular case, somehow there was at least one street that was affected that was missed. So those were the, the things that, that came out, of, you know, from myself and from my neighbors that um, we see that there's some room for improvement. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I totally agree. And we've been working on improving all those procedures, absolutely. Let, let, let's, let's cut to, to uh, the bigger piece of this issue. All right. This is a water utility for uh, for for a population for a city. This, this is uh, there is no um, <laughs> there is no breakdown here. I mean, we had a generator fail, and um, that's the crux of the issue. Because that generator stopped for a period of time, regardless of the quality of the water, Bob. Because that generator stopped, we had to go through. Um, a complete alert and alarm our community and, 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 and go all through this. Uh, our concerns are how did, why did that have to happen and why should it have happened? It was your preventative maintenance on this generator? Was there a maintenance system on this generator? Uh, my understanding, if I'm not mistaken, was that an oxygen sensor failed? It was a water coolant sensor. Okay. Yes. Is that a replaceable item that should be checked with regularity, like belts or plugs or other things on this equipment? We're, we're going to go over that? Is it? We're not up. Well, we were going to go over it, but maybe you want to oh. do it another way. Yeah. Um, I think maybe, let me. Uh, I want to go back to notification. Uh, yeah. Laura, before we go on to that, maybe that'll come up, because I think it'll be easier for you to visually illustrate that. But I'll go back to more some basic things. Uh, more basic is, we all understand, 
This was a major hardship to people. This is Thanksgiving Day. They're entertaining people, their families there. People are getting up early to wash their turkey, get coffee pots going. So it's 7.30 in the morning. We still could notify some people. Can you, can you tell us what happened? Why was there such a long delay between 7.30 and 10 o'clock when the notification went to OEM? And what will we do going forward so that we're moving to more of almost instantaneous communication. So problem, problem occurs, you know, it's 7.30, there's a gap of two and a half hours to 10 o'clock. What happened? Yeah, the, the, the identification of that, of the affected area was not prepared to issue spontaneously in that sense, as far as the actual Sorry, list. Microphone. The, the list of the, the affected streets was not pre-prepared. We had the outline of the service area, but not the actual list. So between generating that list and getting it to Mr. Uh, Clerk, that was part of that delay. So okay. we have since we have all of that prepackaged. So moving forward, what we're doing so that in the event something were to happen again, and God forbid anything ever happens again with water, but if something were to happen again, we've now prepped service areas yes. and we'll be able to almost instantaneously notify the affected parties. Right, for the, the 660 City gradient, 660 or the Countrywood gradient that is ready to go and prepackaged so that um, it is instantaneous in that case. Okay. So Ron, I just got two quick questions. Sean, you done, bud? Well, let me just let me just let me let me go into that a little bit more. So we're going to be able to have everything prepackaged, and we'll be able to communicate it out. And our outbound communication system is going to consist of what? Well, well, chimes just like that. There. <laughs> Stop. Uh, two things. Um, we're looking at it twofold. So we have the outreach program that's being that is in progress to get all of our customers to register for the citizen alert system okay. that's one number two we're going through and scrubbing our database within our billing database for the account holder only by gradient so that we can pull that list out um, with their phone numbers and issue a message to the account holder so, and that, and that's, that's, there's an important difference. So if I have a condominium complex, the account holder is a property manager. So that doesn't get to right. the resident. And that's where the citizen Sorry. alert, that's where the citizen alert system comes in uh, to help us reach out to the tenants, to the consumers, not just to the account holders. So it's, number, it's number, gotta be twofold. Number, number of people contacted it. me saying that they've registered on the website now, your website, as a result of this. Uh, we, we've had a register for the citizen alert uh, button on our homepage for quite a while. Okay, so that, that, Why can't we go so they're, they're doing that. And secondly, we're going to give a notification both on the phone call to Mr. Cork as well as notifying him electronically as well as backup our police department. They are very efficient. This group is very efficient in getting information out. They've proven that. Absolutely. So it's, I just it's want a, to make sure we have the redundancies in yes. place going forward so that our OEM, who's a great communicator, gets the information as quickly as possible. And if for some reason the OEM is not getting that information, it's going to the police department. The key word is verbal contact. Verbal. So it's great. Mr. Quirk, it's the police department. and if. Obviously, the police department, we would get uh, Hindsight's great. But go ahead with your presentation. Yeah, let's finish that. Let's this okay. Question. So, um, Kenneth uh, Crawford is going to discuss the generator maintenance. You're going to have to use this. Uh, so, as far as our maintenance procedures, um, we have uh, some of our facilities that have. So some of our facilities have emergency generators. Up. I can pick it up. <laughs> and what we do is we do a biannual preventative maintenance. Can, can you hear it? Oh. How about this? Yes. All right. 
So it's biannual, so we do it twice a year. And what that entails is the, the activities and the uh, actions associated with those PMs meets or exceeds the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, also, what we do, we test those generators weekly <coughs> under loaded test. So, uh, for one hour. Okay. Well, let me, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. Is there anyone on the staff that is trained to, as an, as an engineer, trained to uh, repair or do, let's say, uh, immediate services to this generator or maintenance services? And do you have, do you have to contract all this out all the time? Yes, sir. They are contracted out. I find a problem with that. that the, we have people on our staff here that run generators and can take the damn things apart and put them back together. This is your water company. Yes, sir. Um, when we get further into the presentation, you're going to see our solution for this. Oh, there, there is a solution. I, I, I love solutions. There, there is a solution. <laughs> there is solutions. a solution. We're building towards it. Yeah, well, let's, let's, let's see the solution. Jesus. One thing I just wanted to bring this slide up uh, very quickly. During the conversations with the mayor and deputy mayor, we learned that there were some other issues with water quality that the residents in this service area were having. I believe it was attributed to one of the issues that we discussed where the cartridge filters were picking up particles. So one of the things I wanted to point out is, oh, okay, I can do this without the slide. From June of 14 to the present, I've only received, we've only recorded 15 water quality complaints. Out of those complaints, the bulk of those were about hardness, which is inherent to the source of water that service is distributed to that area of the system. We had a few taste and odor and one color. Now that means that the only way we can respond to water quality or water supply issues is we need to get the information directly. So what we're asking everybody is if you do have an issue with your water quality to do two things. One, if it's a very urgent issue, please call us directly so we can respond, we can send people out to sample. If it's a non-emergency, you can use our email address through customer service at smcmua.org and we can respond that way as well. But the main thing is to contact us directly as the, the water authority so we can hopefully get out and sample and investigate with our water quality staff or operations staff. In 2016, we uh, revamped our fire hydrant uh, inspection and uh, maintenance procedures. Uh, we did that to come into standards with the industry standards and to improve the overall ISO, ISO scores for uh, the local municipalities. Um, in doing so, we met with the local uh, township fire chiefs and we did this as a group. So as Laura was saying earlier, uh, the country wood system is a direct pump system, which means something mechanical has to be running 24-7 in order to maintain and uh, increase the pressure. Without a storage tank, that means that any interruption in that mechanical process results in an immediate drop in pressure. There's, that's just inherent to that system. In the hydrant maintenance uh, inspections, what we found in 2017 was we can fix this by actually combining two of our gradients. So what we're planning to do is take the Morris Plains gradient. The Morris Plains gradient, which it, okay. This is what we're proposing to do. Incorporate the Morris Plains gradient with the Countrywood gradient, which the Morris Plains gradient has two storage tanks and three water treatment or water producing facilities. That in turn will take all the dependence off of that single generator. And if a generator is to fail, we have the storage facilities and the storage tanks that would float the entire system for however long it takes us to repair whatever it is broke. So we have plenty of time and we don't have to go through this. This is happening now? Yes. Well, it's going to happen in 20. Yeah. Well, this is what I was explaining is the field data that Kenneth was collecting, which is part of our validation for all the gradients for this service area, was literally just completed right before Thanksgiving. So that data was just coming out, the event happened, and then week after that we had another engineer start. So 
the event forced a closer look, but we were on that path to review this data. So we expedited that review, obviously, and the solution is there. But you're prepared to do this um, networking of water right now? Yes, sir. What will the um, it's going to be three phase. We're going to start in January 2018. We're going to do it in three separate phases in order to not disturb the system too much and disturb a lot of water quality and verify the pressures are adequate. Yes, sir. Three phases. It'll take, in my time frame, it'll take three to four weeks to do this without, you know, disturbing the system too much. So the, the two systems will be, those two gradients will now be hydraulically. And the current, what we call the Countrywood Booster Pump Station will actually. Thing it'll affect is water pressure because it's gravity feed going over from a pump. So, all right, I yeah. understand that. And the system still see. <laughs> It, it seems to me that that uh, would resolve the problem, but uh, there are, there are a couple of locations. We had to get this far to find the problem, but go ahead. We just come across the data as far as the hydrant maintenance program, but there are a couple of high spots along the uh, the Countrywood Lane and the Poplar Lane that we need to verify the actual elevation to make sure that this will work, so we're not you know causing more problems. Mm -hmm. So we have a little bit more homework to do, but at this point we're confident it'll work. We just need to solidify the data. You know, Ron, I just want to say something about the communication. With the way we communicate in 2017, almost 2018, I still can't believe the trouble you had communicating with these families. Did you did you request or carry through a reverse 911? Did you talk to the police department about that? Mr. Quirk, I believe, did issue both a reverse 911 and the message on the Everbridge system. Those are two different systems. And how, what percentage of your customers actually sign up to be notified if there's a problem? Do you have that number? Again, the only the only contact we're going to have with our customers would be the account holder information and maybe the tenant information if they're paying the water bill. So typically you don't prepare for a worst case scenario for notification the, unless they sign up to be notified of a worst yeah, case scenario. The reliance has always been on the reverse time one one and now the Everbridge system would be added. Yes. And you don't know what percentage of that area of Hanover Township was signed up to be notified? Uh, no. And no. are you going to be more aggressive in any kind of an outreach to try to get those customers to sign up? And if not, look at Plan B? Yes, we, we have been um, encouraging people to. We are now literally campaigning in terms of uh, inserts, bill inserts, and actual phone calls. Now, with your database, Everybody always has a primary phone number and a secondary phone number because they basically pay you money every month or every quarter, correct? They're your customers. Right? I'd have Use to go back way. and I'd have to go back and look at yes, I can in the billing database we would typically probably have just one phone number. I have to verify that. Because Not wouldn't two. it be easier instead of having them sign up for the latest and greatest communication system of the week, like Everbridge, just notify them through your billing system? Because you you have communication with them and they buy your water every day anyway. That that's where the difficulty comes in because, for example, if it's a condominium complex, the account holder is the property manager. It's it's a it's a bulk bill. So if you have 50 tenants in an apartment complex and the landlord is paying the bill, um, or the property manager, we're not going to have those people will not be in our system. So how do you do it now? Hope that they all signed up for Everbridge. Well, that would be, you know, the reverse 911, that type of a notice, radio announcements, things like that. Because I, I understand equipment fails, um, and it was unfortunate in the day. It was, it was terrible that it was Thanksgiving. But even with Facebook, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a sitting committeeman. I found out about it on Facebook, and everybody was coming. And it's not the first time it happened with the water. It was about a year or so ago right. there was a water issue, and people were communicating on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Again, it's almost 2018. I mean... I don't it's, think that's acceptable. It's it's complex. It really is complex when you try to choose what is the platform. Um, I I still very I feel very strongly about the Everbridge system and the Citizen Alert system because that it gives us common ground as a community for whatever the event is. I so, would be I would really like to see what percentage of that area in Hanover Township currently signed up for it to be notified if there was going to be an emergency because. What would be a real problem if somebody got truly sick? Not, not trying to figure out, you know, I, I've seen systems change over the 
four and a half, five years I've been here. But thank God nobody got sick, Ron. And, it, and, it, and it's not okay. Well, it, it, it's not okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Joan. No, um, the concept of the combined gradient, um, conceptually, sounds great. Um, the, the question is, has this been done before by the water company? No. For this gradient, no. What um, best practices do we have that we can access to ensure that if we do this, there's no interruption in service, and there's main maintenance of the quality of the water because the, the worst thing in the world is we've had a bad problem sure. and we're telling people we've got a solution now and the solution conceptually sounds good but the risk is that we're doing a live test with them because we haven't done this before so I know you talked about you were going to phase this in absolutely but I want to know what other assurances we have that even the phase in people, the, the, the part of the, the, that map that they're being phased in, they're notified that this is going to happen on making it up January 10th, and please be aware of this. You could experience this, this, or this, or that, whatever these things are. Absolutely. And in the event you experience A, B, C, D, or E, here's the hotline to call, notify us immediately, because we really need to over deliver now. We've had a problem, credibility is at stake, and we need to over deliver to make assurances so that the problem doesn't reoccur as something else. Yes, now there would be a full implementation plan. And, you know, we'd be happy to sit down maybe with the engineering division and go over that before we implement it. Yeah, I, I, I really. You, you, did a, you did a follow up mailing as recent as what, a couple weeks ago? Oh, no. Uh, you last, did, this, you did a, so you did a full mailing yes. on this incident, right. and uh, you did some mapping on the back, and I, we all got those mailers. So we got those mailers. Okay. So what uh, Deputy Mayor is talking about is uh, maybe a, uh, uh, a report of some sort that's still through, through a mailing system that gets to every water recipient that says, hey, we're going over to this new um, network of right. water. Mm -hmm. uh, I. I I will say this, okay, I know I've been pretty negative on, on what's going on here, that that sounds like a very good solution because even if your generators work or don't work, it works. And a matter of fact, in cases where you, you, where you don't have generators, uh, you know, pumping, and the pumping's working off of, uh, of line power, the yes. generator never has to work. Yeah, in this okay, case you have your the tanks. That's yeah. your redundancy. Your redundancy is you go over to the system. Uh, so I mean I find I we find never we never understood why this was direct pump, but the the field data really proved out what we thought might work. So this is really what's happening. Well, in the overall, I th I think that is your solution. But but again, I said we're, we're still seething over the fact that uh, uh, that that this whole incident happens over over a, 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 a one generator and one pump station that affects an entire. Uh, region of a community, including I spoke to Morris Plains and the, the mayor of Morris Plains, uh, Frank Juicer, tells me that 60 of his neighbors were also affected as well. Yes, sir. So, I mean, that's, uh, you know, certainly not acceptable. So, go going forward, I, I think we'd like to have your engineer uh, provide the concept proposal to our engineering department um, so that at least they can counsel with you over that. And secondly, and equally as importantly, I'd like for this committee to see the proposed communication that we're going to send to the public in advance of it going out so that there's no surprises. No surprises. That's and they idea. are aware of the, the watchouts, the when will this happen, the watchouts that they need to look at in terms of their water pressure, how it will affect potentially uh, water quality, uh, water taste, uh, whatever the, the, the KPIs are for water so that everyone is well aware, informed of this before we even get into a test mode. Is that perfect? Agreeable? Yes, that makes okay. sense. You know, I, I just want to get back to the communication thing, Ron, because I'm stuck on that. If there's any kind of an emergency, you have to be notified. I mean, I remember back in the old days, you were notified if there was a problem with a washing machine a year after you bought it. This is water. People ingest it, children and our elderly. 
Uh, and we have a lot of children, thank God, and we have a lot. We have a very large percentage of senior citizens. And if they were to drink something like this, they can wind up in a hospital and get very sick. Uh, I really would like a number on how many people signed up for Everbridge, and if you think that's the vehicle moving forward that can best serve our municipality, because it's not that hard to get a phone call. Uh, Brian Cahill is going to be a new committeeman in Hanover Township. With the schools, they always modify their system, their public service system, and we get emails. We get text messages and we get uh, phone calls at our house all at the same time, mm -hmm. and uh, I just can't, I just can't. Let me, Ron, let me I can't just, yeah. Uh, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. Let, let me Great. let me make a, a suggestion. Great. Let me make a suggestion <laughs> because, because I don't think I don't think we as uh, lay people have the total answers, but I, I certainly am on board with the communications aspect of this, including ringing doorbells if we had to ring doorbells in an emergency. But can I suggest that? Uh, Laura, you get together with uh, Tom Cork, our Office of Emergency Management. You get together with Chief Roddy, and that the subject strictly is emergency communication to a community and okay. how to manage that. I don't think you're skilled enough to do it, but I think between our police department and our Office of Emergency Management, both all of you together, you could come up with some sort of an answer. I think there'll be bigger benefits from the community perspective because let's say in the event that there was some air release of some sort I could think of a million reasons why that might happen uh, I mean I, I could think it's, of it's a lot of I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the most tragic situation and I don't even want to think in those terms it's the same this is a people. water system yes but it's it's the same group of people so if we can work together to make this Everbridge system work I think and the reverse 911 then we all benefit with putting all of our energies into the same effort to benefit the community as a whole so I don't have to buy a separate system. Why don't you orchestrate a meeting between our Office of Emergency Management and our Police Department? If you need some help with that, you can sure. let the administrator know. We okay. can put something together and we can work on it. Let's jump over to something else. Okay. Help me out here. This was, this was white when I put it in. Okay. That's... Um, can we have that filter? Oh, you sure can. Because <laughs> I, I just had it. I just, uh, my Board of Health had this for a while, too. Um, I change this filter every three months. Now, lately, and by the way, you feel the weight of that, that cylinder? Mm -hmm. All right, that's sediment. That's not cysts. That's not other. By the way, folks, let me, let me put a little caveat here. I don't want anyone to be frightened over this. That does not mean that that filter is a, uh, a source of bacteria. It does not mean that your water system is unpotable to drink at all. It does not mean that. Just because there's sediment in your water doesn't, doesn't say that, uh, it, that your, your water is not uh, you know, potable. Uh, but the idea of having that much sediment in the water, washing clothes, bathing, etc., concerns me. And I've never seen that before to that degree. We'll investigate. Is there, is there changes in the system that would have produced that? Is that was it a change in surge pressure because of your pump? I, I can't answer that question because we have to go back and look at the address. Maybe there are other people that are having similar issues and then we can investigate. All right, well, that came off a of nine slope drive and I know the guy who lives there. Was, so, was this recent, so this was, unless it was stirred up with the flushing activities with the hydro maintenance, that may have been when, when Kenneth conducted, his team conducted all of the hydrant maintenance, part of that is flushing. And that possibly, if Possib it's a recent issue, that might be why. If this is a new issue, I can't say for sure. But well, it you, your hydrant flushing was about three or four months ago. I've changed three filters. Every three months I change them, and this is what I'm coming up with. So it, it says to me, it's, it's, it says to me that we're picking up sediment. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. Um, again, let me punctuate, folks. It's not a call for alarm. It's just saying to you that this uh, is, not, is not the most palatable way to, to look at your water. Um, but, uh, but having said that, if you could check that out, I'm sure we would appreciate it. I, I also, um, let, me, let me do a little message for our community here. I, I also do recommend, and it's been on Facebook, as you've probably seen it, uh, I've recommended that people uh, understand uh, what a uh, whole house water filter system is or what a water filter system is under the sink, etc. And everybody's come back and said, well, you know, Mayor, I've got a uh, water softener. And so for water softeners do not filter water. 
All right, they take minerals out of water, they make your water softer, your hands feel better, your, your, your lather up easier. They do not filter water. Uh, I highly recommend the most fundamental, basic water system if you have to. You can go to Home Depot, Lowe's, buy one of these things for 69 bucks. It hooks up to your water, after your water meter, and if it does nothing else, you can get cylinders that do various types of filtration. Some just take sediment, some take chlorine, some take cysts, whatever you want to do, how much you want to expend for, for the filter. But it works. And, uh, and the only reason I bring that to your attention is that we are seeing this in the water system. And uh, I would be a little uh, uh, derelict if I didn't tell you that I would highly recommend that you, uh, you do have some sort of a filtration system. Okay. Any other comment from the committee at this point? I'm gonna, if not, I want to open to the public. Any, Any member of the public like to comment? Jim Knight, HUD, 3414 Appleton Way, Whippany. Um, I appreciate the presentation today from the water company, but one observation I have to make is I don't think the presenter really has an appreciation for how bad it is to rely just on one system of communication, particularly the Everbright system. <laughs> Uh, in my community, which is a condo association, uh, who communicate with each other a lot through Facebook, I can't tell you how many people have absolutely no idea about the Everbright system. So if a survey were done, you're going to find that the number of people that are actually on the system are, is extremely small. To rely on that solely, which seems to be your focus because you think it's a great system, I think in this day and age is totally ridiculous. I think you have to have multiple systems of communication, as many as possible. Uh, you may not like social media, but the Facebook, I mean, Mr. Gallagher, Committeeman Gallagher said, as a committeeman, the first he heard of it was on Facebook. So I think you have to look at every possible communication vehicle available, and I really strongly suggest that you take the advice of the mayor, which is to get together with Mr. Quirk, who understands this. We have a whole lot more information here in the township about how to communicate effectively than I believe that you do based on your comments. So it's not a criticism, it's just an observation. No, and it's, it's you know, well taken. I think um, there are a lot of different perspectives on this and if Facebook is, is a very, it sounds like it is very popular within this community, then. It's a form of social network. There are probably others, I mean, you know, but I, but I think there's gotta be something more affirmative than just Facebook. A lot, a lot of people don't use it. Our seniors are, don't, are not, not using social networks. Our seniors are not using a lot of data material, you know? Yeah, she, yeah. Our, own representative, <laughs> our own representative for the water company says he hates it. Uh, but, but nevertheless, nevertheless, Mr. Anacone, how do I, I, how do I, how do I tell I you, how would you like? No, let's get it straight, okay? I said, I didn't hate it. I don't care what you guys do. Do all the things you want to do. Jumping back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. Okay, I'm just telling you there. Are, how, how many seniors represent this town? I think at one time, time said there's something like about 50 or 40, 50 percent of the households in here are seniors. Okay, and I, I don't know. Joe, you can check me down. 28, 28 percent, Mr. Anacone. But go ahead. 28 percent. That's yeah. right. Hey, that's right. 28 percent. 95 years old, but I still have something up here, okay? And I'm telling you that there's a hell of a lot of people that don't subscribe to Facebook. All my grandchildren do, okay? All the millenniums do. But us seniors, we have more to do than just to play there all day long with the, the, the phones and stuff, okay? So I'm telling you that the means of co uh, communication you should be very careful of because you have... 20% of the seniors in this town who probably don't take any of that stuff. I fully, I fully agree. Now, here's my, here's my now, question. I'm going to tell you what the best is, okay? Well, well you tend to, then you tell me, because I was going to, I was going to ask you what the best is, but you the tell me. The best is, the good old days, get some loudspeakers, mount on the police cars, and the easiest thing in the world is set the police cars in the neighborhood with the blaring horns and the good old time and blow everything out of our bed. Megaphone. Gorgeous agreeing with me. Get okay. those, we get those air raid. We can, we can get those. Call your neighbor, make sure he's aware of what's going on. 
you talk, you can do talk about your neighborhood, neighborhood watch that you have, that the police department is so anxious to set up in all the neighborhoods. Get it set up, the neighborhood watch, get your neighbors to talk to each other, which they don't do anymore because they're too busy with all these communications you guys have, okay? <laughs> It's that simple, so simple, and you solve all your problems. I, I, the loudspeakers going through the neighborhood. How do we get our seniors to stop talking? Uh, uh, now, Sal, Sal, that's the, a, the, the, the Sal, Sal, that's my bedtime. Sal, that's, bed. that's an old fashioned reverse 911. Right. Well, you know, this is what I said in the beginning of this presentation, <laughs> didn't I? In a true emergency, in a true emergency, and I have not discussed this with Chief Roddy, and I have not discussed it with our Office of Emergency Management. In true emergency, doorbells will be rung. No loudspeakers, doorbells will be rung. Oh. An, a neighborhood will be segregated. It will be, it will be policed to the point where people are individually known, uh, doorbells are known and, and rung. That's the way to do it. That's yes, the way to do it. It is the responsibility of the township committee to make sure there's a good communication system. And we not are trying. The, company or the electric company or the gas company. They can do what their job has to do with their utility, but it's a basic problem with the United the Township Committee to make sure that all of their citizens are being taken care of. There's no question about it. Sorry. That's why we're here tonight, isn't it? Shouldn't go up. It shouldn't that's, what, that's why we're here tonight. But let me tell you something. When your Township Committee has to wait hours to get the proper communications of the kind of language that we have to put up on our Everbridge message, that's the delay is what we're concerned with. So that's we could, something else. As your representative, your appointed representative, I will make sure that it's being done <laughs> in the water company. So, as, so, our, rep your to the so water company. as our representative to the water company, when were you notified, Mr. Ayanna Cohn, of this emergency? I'm, I'm going to tell you, you'll know all about it pretty soon. Is that my answer? What? <laughs> I said, how, how quickly were you notified of this water alert? You as our representative. Oh, I got an email like everybody else. You got an email. Yeah. I also got a phone call. I take it back. Uh, where uh, I apologize. This gentleman did call me, but he didn't get an answer. I see. Okay. Well, all right. Thank you, uh, Jimmy. You had something to say. I had a couple of questions. <laughs> One being, please, uh, <laughs> Jim Martin from Twelfth Annick Road. Um, when the when the this uh, cooling system broke down, was there an alarm set off internally that you, your phone rang and said we got a problem somewhere? Yes. Okay. And that was at two o'clock in the morning, or we that were notified that the um, the power went out at two o'clock. We we knew that the generator started. We know the generator was running. We got the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we got the notification at 2 o'clock that the generator did start and was running as designed. And we did get notification at um, 6 o'clock that it failed, and we dispatched our, our operators at that time. At 6 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. when it failed? When, when the generator failed, yes. Okay. That, at, at 6 o'clock in the morning, we are now in a back backwash mode. Is that correct? Based off of our information, yes, at 6 o'clock in the morning when the generator failed and the power was not restored. And nobody, nobody was there from the alarm until 6 o'clock when it completely failed? Correct. Okay. I, I, see a, I, I see a big gap there, okay? When that thing says you have, you know, an alarm going off, I think well, somebody should attend. It wasn't an alarm as much as letting us know that it was running on emergency power. But one thing that we have, we've changed our SOPs, where now anytime that generator is running, there is an operator stationed at that facility at all times while that generator is running, whether it's routine test or emergency generator, uh, emergency power. So you have emergency 24 hours. Yes, sir. That's okay. okay. Next thing I just wanted to say was, just as Jim indicated, people in the condominiums don't communicate. They go off to work and and. They don't sign up for this alarm system that we have that says, okay, street number 20, you know, you know Everbridge. Jefferson Avenue is going to be closed down for 24 hours. 
Right. They're saying, who cares? I'm not signing up for that trash. I'll just find out in the paper what happened or whatever. So I think basically commun you can't go on your system that has the owner of the condominium getting notified. You have to have all 500 people that are li living, living in that community of that condominium. You have to have their in information. I don't know how you can push it back to the representative that he has to supply all the people he is charging in their condominium rates. They're paying for the water service through their rent. Or, you know. So, I mean, that's where a big breakdown is that people don't use the uh, emergency system that we've got designed, and you can't base anything on that. It becomes a very interesting challenge on how to tackle that part of it. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, but you've got to get to each and every house within the community. That's, and that's what I see as a... Jim, do you have common water meters, or does everybody have a water meter? Everybody has a water meter. No, I mean in the, in the condominium association. Oh, I don't know about the condominium. Four, meters. They might four, four meters, meters for the whole. Four meters for not necessarily. Some, some do, some are single uh, part of the condominium. Just one water meter. We, what, what, we have yeah. some that sub meter. The property owner might sub meter, but they're not our meters. Yeah, yeah. You, you know what it might, well, when you're dealing with condo, dealing with individual residents, they can do a mailing with a postcard that says you must register for Everbridge to be if you want to be alerted, right? That's an individual resident. But what do I do in a condo? Do I send you 150 of these postcards and say to you, distribute them as chairperson of your association? People are not going to do something like that. And in As Committeeman Gallagher said, this is 2018. Communication should not be an issue. You should be able to reach every person there through a variety of methods. You have the, you have the Facebook page, which has over 4,000 people on it. You have condominium units like ours that have a Facebook page that have about a 50% subscription rate. You have reverse 911, which is pretty universal and you have the Everbright system. So there are a variety of methods, and my point that I made before, which I'll make again, is you can't pick one system and say, well, that's the best system, that's the system we're going to use. No, you have to use as many possible systems as but you I, can. But I do think the reverse 911 is the only way to ring a phone in an ind individual residences, be it condo or otherwise. And that words. actually only applies to landlines, which are Yes. becoming obsolete. That's yeah. another problem. And, but That's you know, another problem. The, yeah. uh, I know it's a utility, but there's lots of organizations, and the airlines are one of them. You have to give them a cell phone number. I yes, mean, but for example, if you are a tenant in an apartment complex and that property manager is our account holder, I don't know who you are. So the, the complexities of this is how do I let you know, or how does a property manager, should they be obligated to inform you? The, manage, that the management companies right. of the condo associations, most of them have asked for people to give their cell phone numbers. They do a census once a year or every two years, and they have it. So it, I'm just saying that you have to explore every possible communication method that is available. It's 2018, and yes, you're never going to get every single person but you can get a good 98, 99%. And if, you, if something like ringing doorbells, if it reaches that elevation, that's great, but that still takes a couple hours. Oh, yeah. If there is a true emergency, I mean, you might want to take advantage of Mr. Ionicone's recommendation to have a, a speaker system. You I'm going to go buy right a megaphone. Are you suggesting, we put, is out there pretty are you suggesting we put loudspeakers in our budget now for, uh, Mul for 2000? Multiple communication method, uh, methods. Yeah. I, I would like to make a recommendation. Don't rely on just one method. That's, possibly. that's my recommendation. I think I agree with you, Jim. Would it, would it be possible maybe for, um, for me to come back next month to, do you have a, a committee that I can meet with? Um, well, that's why I'm suggesting, bit, oh, yeah. I'm suggesting that you coordinate with Mr. Quirk, who's sitting in the back of the room, along with Chief Roddy. Uh, Tom, who else should be on that? One of our fire, uh, representing some uh, fire company. Who, who's in charge of the of, uh, communication outreach, let's say, even in the fire companies? Well, fire 
our districts, myself, Mr. Giorgio, is, is uh, very important as a public information officer. Um, and this is the police department. I think we get limited for that. That we be a strong group to work with. Right okay. Now. Would that be a start to, okay. for you guys to meet? Okay. Laura, I recommend it. Right, okay. before we close this portion out, I just want to say to Jim, I got a text this morning at 6.09 from the public schools. Oh, it's no. Hanover Schools, the Hanover Township Public Schools will have a two-hour delayed opening today, Thursday, December 14th, no early bird program. I also got an email, and I also got a phone call to my landline, so there's better ways of doing things. So just to reiterate what you said off of what I said, thanks, Jim. Terry, how are you? Yes, hi. Terry Baird, 180 Persephone Road, New Albany section of Hanover. Um, before you spoke about people who made complaints, how many was that? How many complaints did you receive? That was uh, about 16. 16. And what was the time frame for that? From June to the present. Okay. Um, from June to the present. Oh, June, yeah. So that's like the past five months. Um, there were there were several of us that did come go to one of your meetings. Yes, to, the the hardness to, complaints. To, yes, look, to express our concerns. Right. And um, we did have people come out, and um, it kind of went nowhere. And to to be frank, people are just frustrated, and they just don't want to have anything to do with it because it's like there's so much problems with the hardness of the water and the quality and the chlorine. It burns your skin. It's just, you know, like everybody, every household in town has to get something to remove the chlorine. Then they got to get something to remove the hardness. You know, and it's like, well, what are we paying? And, and we got to all buy bottled water. We all got to go down to Costco and get them six gallon containers of bottled water. 295 so we have for 36. To drink. 295 for 36 bottles. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and because, you know, the hardness of the water creates crystals in our urine. So now we have everybody who has kidney stones. Uh, my dog has had kidney stones. My guinea pig had kidney stones. My cat has kidney stones, just had one removed um, for $1,200. Um, so, you know, we all have to go through this when it should be the authority, the, the water authority's responsibility to take care of these things in the water at the source, as opposed to every single homeowner having to deal with all these individual problems and then having to absorb the expense. Plus, we have to pay for the water on top of it. You know, if, if we all have to have all these systems in our house and these kind of filters and filter on your shower, filter underneath your, you know, uh, after the water meter, a filter underneath your sink. Some people have reverse osmosis. Some people have, you know, water softeners. Some people can't have water softeners because they have high blood pressure. You know, maybe you could um, have like a, a bulk buying thing and we could buy it from you or something so that we could have better hmm. water quality at the source of our home. I mean, it, it you know, it'd be, uh, you know, cost beneficial to all of us as as homeowners and and you know we're, we we can't choose our water company. Yes, yeah, so and when uh, the group that came in to speak to us before one of the um, the issues, there were a group of residents that had uh, had concerns about the hardness of the water primarily, and one of the um, people had suggested that instead of treating it within the home could the water utility treat it at the source if that was they even said if even if we pay a little more for our water we would rather you treat it and not for us so what we had discussed was we did have our water quality drew saskowitz um, met with all of you i believe and went and took samples and for 2018 one of our projects is to make that assessment to start looking into how can we do that well, uh, you know, to answer Terry's question, I mean, uh, uh, you know, there, I, I guess there's certain limits that you can go to. But, you know, our, you, you have a board of health here in town, and they're also uh, very aware of uh, monitoring the water quality. They do get reports from the water company, uh, and they do look at it. They meet uh, on a regular basis, monthly. Uh, and uh, given the problem that we just had, uh, their focus on the water is going to be intensified a little bit. They'll probably do their own testing. Uh, but on a grander scale, I mean, we had some trouble in the country woods areas uh, some time ago before the pump station was in. 
the water company had to install individual pumps in every single one of our houses. So you know, down down below in your utility room, you had a you had a, a electronic pump and you had a 50 gallon tank that maintained 60 ground the 60 psi pressure for the house. But they took those out when the water when the uh, pumping station went in. So I guess my point is, you know, on a grand scale, I mean, the water company has to has to treat us in a, in a, in a as a mass rather than try and find individual solutions for every household. And, and, and that's exactly what we're planning on doing for 18, is have, to do that comprehensive review. I have one final question. Um, in reference to the chlorine level of the water, um, why is it that it seems to go up on, on the weekend and it goes down by Tuesday? You know, like it, the, the odor of the chlorine, I feel like I, I'm living in a swimming pool sometimes. And this isn't just my first draw of water first thing in the morning. This is later on in the day. Um, and it's, some, it's a horrible way to ruin a great cup of tea, I want to tell you. But it seems to be, and my daughter and I have noticed it because my daughter is highly allergic to it, um, that what happens is on the weekends, the chlorine level seems to go higher than during the weekday. Can um, I have Drew reach out to you and we'll go over that sure. in detail? Okay. You can come to my house again. Okay. 180 Precipity Road, Whippany Section, Hanover. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Are there? Oh, there are. Yeah. Alan McIntosh, I live on Palm Court. Um, two issues. Um, one of them was uh, why did it take you an extra two and a half hours to add our street to the list of streets affected? I noticed John, my neighbor, adding, nodding his head to that. I think you answered that question. Your street list was obviously compiled manually, and somebody just must have made a boo-boo somewhere, um, it sounds like. Um, the other question was, um, we got a phone call that morning from Everbridge, and our street obviously was not on that list, and we called your emergency number, and we asked the question, you know, hey, we got this phone call, but our street wasn't on the list, what's going on here? And basically the people at the emergency number were totally clueless. Uh, I haven't heard you talk about that tonight at all. Basically they said, what boil water or what problem? Now, um, I will give you credit, they did get back to us in 20 minutes and patted us on the head and said, well, if you're not on the list, then it doesn't apply to you. Not true, but uh, so, you know, uh, like I said, some, some kudos for at least getting getting back to us on, on that. So I, I guess I, I like to hear what you have to say in, in response to that. Yes, we are, I had a meeting with our customer service division and they are working to improve uh, that answering service's response, but outside of how the answering service would respond that in this type of an event, we would have our own live operators that work for the authority answer the phone. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. If there's no other uh, questions on the floor, I'm going to close that portion of the meeting. Okay. Anybody would like to uh, summarize? And yeah, I think that we discussed, we had a major problem, we're all aware of that. We've heard the resolution of the problem. I think there are four things that came out of this in terms of the communication protocol, that there's going to be a meeting with Mr. Quirk as well as a member of our police department um, I would hope that that is scheduled very soon, like within 48 hours. Um, number two, there'll be a meeting with our engineer in your engineering department to discuss the concept which you're putting forward, as well as assurances in the plan that are put into place so that there are no interruptions of the water supply. We are maintaining the quality of the water supply. We're maintaining the pressure of the supply, adequate pressure. Mm -hmm. Third point is that assuming that meeting goes well, we have the plan in place, this township committee then would be given a pro forma communication that would go out to the members of the public who would be affected within the town area where this migration would occur. And the last thing I heard was quality of the water. There is uh, attempts on a part of the water authority to go and visit people's homes to actually pull the samples, but what other things can we do to really get to the next level so that we're not having to filter upon filter 
and filtering upon filtering whether that's good or not. So those are the four things that I, I took away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, we apologize for um, all of these issues, and we will definitely keep you updated in terms of all of our corrective actions and improving them. But I appreciate you, your patience. Laura, thank you for the Ron. presentation. I think it, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, George. I just want to add one thing. When you have this committee set together, I think get the seniors involved, someone from the senior organization, okay, even to the fact of perhaps one day making a presentation. But the important thing is that they're right. A lot of them don't, do not use Facebook. I can tell you that. They all got their clap phones and their everything, you know, but they've got a network that does work well. Okay, and perhaps that can be extended out that way. So I'll definitely make sure a senior, you know. Are you taking, taking over the seniors club next yeah. year? George will be the well, president we'll of the seniors club. We'll get a representative yeah. anytime you want. Yeah. Okay, that'd be great. Maybe we can okay. just meet with you on one-on-one -on -one and, and. You know what? That might be a good audience to start with. <coughs> sure. yeah. It's a vulnerable population. Yeah. So. Yep. You know, Ron, about that issue too is um, when we have weather Very alerts. Good. Carmen Blandino shares them with the senior group. Now George will be the president. George can share it with well, the senior Carmen's group. Not doing much He's so that would be great, George, if uh, you can handle that aspect. Thank okay, you, Laura. So appreciate, we'll appreciate the explanation. We all went through a very hard uh, hard issue, uh, our Thanksgiving, and uh, hopefully these corrective measures will prevent this from ever happening. Again. Absolutely. Thank you. Laura? Okay. <clears throat> This is George's card where? Okay. Let me uh, get such a nice card. I have made you get a card like that. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Administrator, let you go on with your. Oh, at this point, yeah. Um, all right, uh, gentlemen, uh, it's customary at this time once again to open the floor to the public for any Smooth. item not appearing on the agenda. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open. I know we've had a long discussion on water company, etc., some other matters. But if anyone else would like to address the oh, Township you. Committee at this time, this is the time to do it, giving us your name and address for the record. Hearing none. Seeing none. Motion to close? Motion to so close. All Sorry. in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Administrator. Thank you. <coughs> Sal, go home. It's 10 o'clock. <laughs> what do you say? He doesn't know what it takes much more. You're, you're not sitting up here. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the first item of uh, official business uh, on the formal agenda is a letter addressed to Chief Mark Roddy, and it's from Detective Christopher Thompson. Please accept this letter of retirement from the position of detective. My last day at the Township of Hanover Police Department will be March 16, 2018. It has been a pleasure working as part of your department. Best regards, Detective Christopher Thompson. In accordance with uh, our policy, may we have a motion to accept the letter of retirement? So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Coppola. Seconded by Mr. Gallagher. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So accepted. We have the following departmental reports uh, on file in the administrator's office. They include the reports of the construction official for all activities conducted during the months of December, or November rather, through December 14th. We have the reports of the township's property maintenance officer on all activities conducted prop by property maintenance through the 13th of December. Our superintendent of public works has submitted his reports on all projects and activities conducted by public works during the month of November. And the township's chief municipal finance officer acting in his capacity as treasurer has submitted uh, two reports on the sum summary of budget revenues for November and again through December 13th, 2017. And finally, we have the report of the township engineer on an update on all capital projects as of 
today. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a public hearing and consideration of adoption of six ordinances this evening. The first is docketed as ordinance number 24-2017. We have the uh, proof of publication that the ordinance and the notice of introduction appeared in full in the November 15th issue of the Daily Record. The uh, ordinance in accordance with the municipal land use law has been filed with the Morris County Office of Planning and Res uh, Preservation. We have their acknowledgement on that. All of the contiguous municipalities to Hanover Township were notified in writing by certified mail and regular mail. And in accordance with uh, the referral requirements under the municipal land use law, ordinance number 24-2017, was referred to the planning board for review and recommendation. And we have on file uh, a letter from the planning board uh, recommending the adoption of Ordinance 24-2017. So at this time, may we have a motion to open the public hearing on Ordinance number 24-2017. I'll move to open hearing, and I would also like the public to benefit uh, from a uh, history about the Whitney Center Zone uh, over the past 10 years, and I think uh, our our uh, planner, Mr. Branchow, um, um, can provide the public with some great information and some great facts. Okay, but first we have to take the motion to open it to the public. So moved. We have a second. motion by Mr. Faramaska, seconded by Mr. Bruno. On roll call, Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramaska. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Capola and Mr. Francioli. Aye. So I think, uh, you know, and we'll do respect to uh, our director of planning, I think perhaps Mr. Branchow would give his report first, and that way we can entertain any questions at that point. The uh, Whipping Center zone was a zone that the Township Committee uh, created in 2009. Uh, it was the result of uh, examination by the planning board in trying to redevelop the area near the intersection of Route 10 and Troy Hills Road, uh, which had been occupied by an air conditioning heating uh, contractor, uh, former restaurant dwelling, uh, the Whippany Firehouse uh, and Fire Commissioner's uh, Office, uh, a bunch of different uses that uh, were really no longer serving uh, a purpose and it had gotten run down. Uh, the zone was intended to encourage the redevelopment of the area with a mixed-use uh, development, including retail and housing. Uh, and like I said, that was adopted in 2009. Uh, <coughs> later on in 2009, there were some minor amendments to the ordinance for that zone. In 2013, the planning board adopted a master plan amendment that reflected the zoning that existed in place. It called for uh, also a mixed-use plan development on 80 acres of land. Uh, as a minimum, it called for 46 residential units. Uh, the ordinance also calls for 46 residential units as a maximum, uh, with some affordable units as part of that. In September 2016, the Township Committee uh, adopted some technical revisions to that ordinance. In June of this year, the Township Committee uh, did some amendments to the ordinance which would allow small-scale industry with a retail if it was related to food and beverage. So, for example, a baker could uh, sell baked goods but also manufacture them at the site. Uh, an ice cream maker could do the same thing. Uh, a brewery could do the same thing. Tonight, uh, the public hearing is on yet another amendment of that ordinance. Uh, and that amend this amendment would uh, reduce the minimum acreage needed for a planned development from nine acres to eight, which is consistent with what the master plan uh, recommends as eight units, eight acres, I'm sorry. Um, and would make a number of other revisions to the zone standards designed to encourage redevelopment of the uh, property. 
Uh, there's no change proposed in the residential component uh, in the zoning, which has been on the books now for eight and a half years. Uh, when the Planning Board considered recommending this ordinance to the governing body, it was driven by a number of uh, factors. One was that it's been now eight and a half years since the zone was created, and yet the property has not redeveloped as planned. Uh, yes, we did get a CVS. Yes, we did get a Chase Bank. Uh, but the rest of the development hasn't moved forward and hasn't been able to move forward because the ordinance requires, as, as of this time, it has required nine acres of land. That's only possible if all of the property owners in the zone work together towards a unified development. Despite some effort at that happening, that hasn't happened. It doesn't look like it's going to happen. And so the planning board really was faced with a question of, do we let it sit like this, or do we reduce the acreage to what we know uh, can work together and at least get the property redeveloped? So that was one of the factors that the Planning Board was looking at in recommending this uh, amendment to the zoning. Uh, the Planning Board also was uh, cognizant that the Whippany Fire Company property was about to sell, uh, and my understanding is that is pending, um, and that this would uh, provide an opportunity for a new look at possibly working together with the developer, but they did not want to hold up redevelopment for that to happen. So again, the recommendation to reduce the area to not have to include the fire company property for that type of development to occur. Uh, thirdly, the, the township is currently before the Superior Court on uh, another affordable housing plan. Uh, I won't go into the details about affordable housing policy in New Jersey and how it's been a mess over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, but this site is included in our plan as an affordable housing site. And because it has not moved forward, uh, it's been questioned whether it's actually a viable site. Um, and the township believes and the planning board believes that eliminating this uh, minimum nine acre requirement, reducing it to eight, will allow the development to move forward and therefore eliminate the obstacle to uh, making the site viable for helping the town to meet its affordable housing obligations. So that's basically the history and the summary of uh, what has happened with the WC zone and what we're trying to achieve by this ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Branchow, for providing us the history and the rationale on the zone recommended change. So let, uh, just to be clear, and, and please, you, you always give a very extensive detail, and that's good, uh, but, but fundamentally, uh, this uh, separates, separates out the fire company's property from the zone and the zone from the fire company's property. But, but at the They're same still time, in the same zone, the yes. Sta right, so the standards in the zone apply to all the property owners in that zone. There's, there's two sets of standards. One is for like small lots, and then there's one standard for what we call a plan development, which would be one coordinated project. Right. And the standard is designed to encourage that coordinated project, still allowing individual lot development, but if the property owners could work together, they'd actually get a better product, and the township would get a better product. But that was the, that's the intent. So this would allow the fire company still to work with and work become a plan development, but it wouldn't require it. Right. They could share it in a, in a condominium type of way. Correct. Snow plowing, landscaping, other types of details, if they chose. Shared parking, all kinds of things, yes. It's the, now it's their option to It's an option. Not. It's not mandatory Thank under you. this ordinance. Thank you. Is there anyone present wishing to be heard concerning ordinance number 24-2017? Please give your name and address for the record. Jim Knight, 3414 Appleton Way, Whippany. Um, it's more of a question than a comment. A lot of, you, you keep referring to the standards are not going to change within the zone. <clears throat> is, is any of the standards centered around the visual continuity? Because I think from a, a resident standpoint and a community development standpoint, the idea of a town center is highly dependent upon visual continuity. Are you talking about an, an architectural continuity in, in look, in attitude? In, in look. Uh, is that were, part of the there standard? Are standard there are standards yeah. in the zone 
that require in the plan development that there be a architectural compatibility amongst all the buildings. So if the firehouse property is bifurcated from the other eight acres, does that still, that, is that requirement of visual continuity still apply among all nine acres, or well, does, uh, that change, does that change? There is language in the ordinance, I believe, and I want to just Gas lamps, that, cobblestone that areas, etc. That would require things even of, if things it's Things of separate. character like that, that try and integrate all the properties as this one look. You know? So all nine acres will still have that requirement. Well, I, I think that's so. the intent, but I may be... I know that's the intent. I, be, I know that's the intent. I may stick corrected here. Let me... Let, let the planner... Uh, there's been some time since I uh, took a peek at this ordinance. It is a correct, Gene? Okay. It's a... So Chairman of the Planning Board just said I am correct so in that so the integrity of the zone is protected by the kinds of gas lamps, the kinds of lighting fixtures, the kind of uh, uh, landscape, etc. Okay, yeah. so this bifurcation of the eight acres and the one acre will not affect that. All Should nine acres will still be bound by that? Okay, that, correct. that was my concern. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in chambers wishing to be heard? That was an important point. Okay, before I ask for a motion to close the public hearing, um, I want to point out that an ordinance is legislation, similar to legislation that's passed by the Senate and General Assembly on the state level, and similar to a measure um, before the Congress of the United States. Normally, the protocol for anyone to make comments is that you have to be physically present here in these chambers to uh, address the township committee and make your points of view known to the governing body. In this case, we have uh, this evening a special request from a resident. Uh, normally, we would not admit such comments into the record because the person is not physically present to hear any rebuttal that might be presented by any member of the governing body or by the planner. However, we're making the exception in the interest of transparency so that no one can uh, say that we are not accepting any comments into the record. So that being said, I'm going to read into the record the following letter that was hand delivered to my office yesterday. And it is as follows. Dear Mayor and Township Committee. This is a comment regarding the Whippany Center Ordinance 2417. I am unable to attend the hearing, so I am presenting my comment in writing to be read into the record. I sat on the Hanover Township Committee in 2008 when the first two Whippany Center Zone Ordinances were defeated, and I was mayor in 2009 when the current Whippany Center Ordinance was passed. I am partial author of the WC Zone, along with Hanover Planner Blaze Branchow. I am intimately familiar with the current ordinance, and I want to share some history. The current WC Zone contains certain conditions which, if met, gives the landowner extra amenities and benefits. A minimum tract of nine acres was added to the zone to ensure that the landowner, Vision Equities, would work in partnership with the Whippany Fire Company to create Whippany Village. The minimum tract area includes the Vision Equity lot and the Whippany Fire Company's land combined. It was put in place for specific benefits to both entities. Whippany Fire Company would get a new firehouse and Vision Equities would reap an extra third story within a two-story height limit and 46 residential apartments over the retail stores. When the zone was passed, Vision Equities had promised the fire company a land swap from its current location in the floodplain to a piece of land up on the hill. In the beginning, it was everybody, everybody's understanding that Vision Equities promised to build the new firehouse. Then it was to supply the labor to build the new firehouse, and eventually it was just a swap of land. 
Ultimately, the parties could not come to terms, so the fire company has since built this firehouse elsewhere. The current ordinance was carefully crafted to contain common green space and green setbacks, a buffer of tree screening, the adjoining residential neighborhood, and fencing from the active railroad line as an incentive for the vision equities to include the Whippany Firehouse in the development of Whippany Village, the extra amenities were added to ensure the vision equities Whippany Fire Company partnership. A similar attempt to amend the Whippany Center Zone to reduce the minimum acreage, reduce the setback and buffers, and eliminate common areas was introduced and defeated a few years ago. When issues arise regarding the WC zone, Mayor Francioli rightfully steps down off of the podium and recuses himself since he is an honorary member of the Whippany Fire Company and the Whippany Firehouse is in the WC zone. Nevertheless, amending the WC zone does not benefit the, the fire company. As a matter of opinion, it is a slap in the face because it gives Vision Equities all the extra benefit put in place to help the fire company without ever, without having to do so. Furthermore, the old firehouse does not meet the minimum tract area criteria, so changing the minimum area has no effect on its property. Also, it is already under contract to sell. I might also add that the 46 residential apartment units have no yards. The backyard is a parking lot on Morris and Erie Railroad property, and residential and retail parking is shared parking. I sat on the planning board when CVS was approved. A six-foot stockade fence and a buffer of evergreen trees is part of the approved site plan, but it has never been installed. I believe the township can do a lot better if it wants to amend the WC zone, and I would recommend defeating this amendment and going back to the drawing board when the new committee is seated next year. I do not think it is in the best interest of the public to allow three stories in residential housing above retail stores with shared parking and no yards for children to play. All this mixed use, cramming housing units in, with, and on top of commercial buildings is not looked upon favorably by our residents. The current WC ordinance currently allows conventional development of commercial and retail use. The property can be developed right now only without residential apartments. To reduce the minimum acreage to eight acres to allow the added use of 46 residential units of housing in a retail zone and an extra third story of building height would be a travesty and it defeats the reason for extra use, height and densities were added in the first place. In the interest of the town and the adjoining neighborhood, I urge the committee to defeat Ordinance 2417. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Very truly yours, Leonardo A. Ferriello. Mr. Ferriello is not present, as the administrator said, to respond to questions or uh, comments from this township committee. Uh, but since, in fact, in his letter, uh, he does mention the Office of the Mayor, let me clarify a few points uh, for the record. Uh, number one, uh, as an honorary fireman, which I much appreciate uh, with the Whippany Fire Company, uh, I checked my standing with the township attorney as to whether or not I could vote on such matters. It is the opinion of the attorney that that honorary standing does not preclude me from voting. I have never, never recused myself, as is stated in this, from any vote on this property. Uh, secondly, uh, the writer mentions that Vision Equities, in his opinion, was to build, build 
this firehouse, multi-million dollar firehouse, at Vision Equity's expense as part of this deal. I sat on this relocation committee from the very beginning, and as uh, I'm proud, proud to say that I tried to orchestrate a swap of lands in the very beginning of this thing. Never, never was the idea of this builder obligating himself to building the firehouse at 100% of his cost ever spoken about. That is completely fictitious. There were issues regarding the land swap that were unfortunate. Uh, in the process of that, Whippany Fire Company did what it necessarily had to do and find a more equitable way to build their firehouse, and they did. But uh, I feel that I had to respond at least to a certain uh, area of a certain amount of these comments, uh, which are not credible, uh, and it certainly is the opinion of that writer, which he's entitled to. But as you can see, he is not present in this audience tonight to even respond to it. So thank, thank you, 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 Mr. Administrator. Before we close the public hearing, any additional comments from the public? Yes, Mr. Faramaska. Uh, the, the, the planning board uh, has worked on this for nearly a decade. Um, and memories fade, uh, perceptions change over time, uh, except there is some continuity with all of this, and the continuity is with the, um, the professional planner who we've had for over 10 years. So what I'd like to do is invite the planner um, to comment um, so that we maintain accurate accounting of facts because there's a lot of perceptions that exist mm -hmm. that people have here, people in the public have, but I think it's important and I think it's very important that the record show the facts. So I would ask the planner, if the planner has any comments uh, regarding what was just read into the um, record from a member of, of the community. I have a few. I mean, I addressed some of them already in my earlier statements, but just a few, a few points I'd like to make. Um, the letter almost reads like the sole reason for making this change was to help the fire company, and that was never the case. Yes, we were aware of the uh, attempt to relocate the firehouse at the time, but the, the primary reason for including all of the property in the zone in a planned development was that it would, wouldn't be split by the fire company, we'd get a better product as a result of it. If that ended up helping the fire company, all well and good, but that was never the primary motivation to doing this. The primary motivation was, as I said before, to redevelop the property and to get a better product by having in incentivizing, if you will, planned development that would have shared access, shared parking, shared utilities, sh similar light fixtures, similar signage, all, all of that being a unified design. Um, that didn't, didn't work out. So the question was, is it better to have 90% of a loaf than none? I think the planning board's recommendation was yes, but it was never solely based upon helping the fire company. So I would, I would dispute that part. Um, as to the, the um, the complaint about the housing and not having any yards um, and about the residential in general, general um, I personally feel, and I think the planning board feels, that this type of mixed-use development um, is something that is appropriate, that it's something that adds vibrancy to developments. Uh, and in fact, Mr. Ferriello himself, when he was on the board and when he was on the governing body, voted in favor of the ordinance that uh, allowed 46 housing units on top of retail. So he's now criticizing something that he himself voted in favor of on more than one occasion. So I don't understand why he is now flipped um, and has a, a different opinion, but at the time he didn't think it was a bad idea. I don't think it's a bad idea. Now, as to not having yards, most apartments don't have yards. Um, when you live in an apartment, you, that you understand that's what comes with it. But especially the new trend towards mixed-use development doesn't have yards. I will note that this ordinance 
adds a requirement for a 4,000 square foot open space conveniently located. So there will be some area where people can recreate. It won't be surrounded by a parking lot. There is an open space provision inside that as well. Um, so, you know, I, I, I won't say really anything more, but I think we've already stated the reasons for the amendment, the reasons for the zone, um, and the fact that the fire company has moved on, uh, is already uh, working on its new firehouse off-site the property, so that's no longer an issue in my opinion. Thank you, Lloyd. Ron, I have one comment if I can. Absolutely. Just one comment I'd like to make here. This, um, this, like John said, I, I found out the other day that the first approval on this was in 2005. I think that was with the planning board. Mm -hmm. And somebody called me just today and said, Gallagher, why all of a sudden are you guys taking this on? We've been talking about this in earnest for a couple of years. I'm going on year five. We've been talking about this in earnest for at least three years. And we've looked at the firehouse as an option and what we could best do to protect the fire department and what would be best with our move to serve them in the best way we possibly can. Uh, so I believe everything is timing. I think the timing is very good because a few things are lining up right now. So I just wanted to address the issue on why rush this and why all of a sudden are you bringing this to the floor. We've talked about this for years. And um, there, there was no rush on this, but the only thing we all wanted to do was take the time and do it right and uh, make sure that our step was a positive one. And again, with this decision and this project, I believe the beneficiaries uh, will be the Hanover Township residents. It, it should be a beautiful project. I just want to weigh in on that. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Mayor, Mr. Paul. George? Yeah, I'm not going to echo what the, all these gentlemen have stated, but I will say this. 2008 was the first time I ran for office, and I can tell you, I came to every meeting. This room was packed. They discussed every, and this is our um, writer was in on that meeting as a member of the committee. They discussed everything, um, uh, setbacks, yards, you know, the whole bit, and even affordable housing. When back then in 2009, when the, the writer of this request became mayor, it was approved, and he helped approve it. So I didn't understand what all this took place. But regardless, the most important thing is, I, I took the opportunity to get the minutes for every single meeting that was done in, in 2008. And I can tell you, I can assure you, that not once was there ever anything said by the developer that he would build a firehouse. And if you want to see them, I have them, because I took page for page for page, because I kept saying, damn, if he was bright, you know, he should be doing so. Well, he never once. Uh, there were people who were spoke that Presume he was going to do it, but I can tell you right now, he never did. And if anybody wants to see that, I've got it at home. Thank you, George. Yeah. <clears throat> Mayor. Mr. Samra. Ma Mayor, if I just may, very briefly, from a legal perspective, you know, there's a lot of things about this ordinance that are well grounded and supported. Uh, so <laughs> I just want to highlight them briefly. First, this actual ordinance originated with a number of meetings before the planning board. The planning board took its time, looked at the master plan, looked at the fact that there was a great desire to do something to redevelop this area and make it more viable and attractive. And that, you know, that was something that they did at least, as far as I could follow, at least twice. They looked at it and felt like this was very sound and consistent planning. And you plan in a way that's best for the township, that's consistent. So when someone says, well, if you do this, it's a slap in the face, it's not personal that way. You have to do what's right for the township, which makes the township viable. Because if you make something personal, then you, you know over time, you're going to have something that nobody is going to want, or it's going to stay dormant. So there's a very big. Uh, Plus here, as far as, as, as Blaise Blanchow said, to make it a viable site for the residents, for the properties that are on 
in that zone, which includes the firehouse. And as said, you know, during this time period, if some developer comes forward for the firehouse, there's the shared usage for infrastructure and development. And as far as the backyards and things of that nature, candidly, you have all different uses in the town, residential uses. But to some people, it's desirable. They don't want a backyard. They'd like the ability to walk to retail and have that town center feel. So it may not attract a, a variety of residents, but there's certain residents who do, they're at that stage in their life where they want that type of amenity and you're there to <coughs> offer it. And, it. and that type of amenity and with the number of units, it generates the use of retail and makes the whole center vibrant. And I want to say also we have quite a bit of litigation uh, regarding, and many towns do, regarding affordable housing. And we have developers coming forward saying, we want in. We're gonna, this is going to be our way to get higher density development. With respect to this site, I have to say, and it's not often we can say to, we don't, you know, we don't want to say too many things one way or the other with respect to a developer. But in this case, it has stayed the same. There's been a number of developers who've jumped in as interveners. This developer has said, this is what we think works. We're not going to test the litigation waters. We're not going to get involved in the affordable housing litigation to try to get additional density. This is what we need to make it work. They've been consistent with the planning board in their discussions and consistent with the township committee. And the ordinance was discussed over the past few years and then again over the past four or five months due consideration was given. And I, you know, I went back to uh, the developer's attorney to make sure there's no other claims or anything like that that, that are going to come forward. Uh, this is exactly as presented. And there's a, there, there's a legal and a justifiable basis for this ordinance. And, and it is for the vitality of the, the area, consistent with the master plan, consistent with our affordable housing plan, which the township says, we've already met our obligation. This is part of that plan. So just want to add that from a legal perspective. <clears throat> okay, at this time, may we have a motion to close the public hearing. So moved, so moved second. by Mr. Capola, seconded by Mr. Gallagher. Uh, the uh, vote to close the public hearing. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Fermasca. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Capola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. Now, on adoption, be it resolved that an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the Township Committee of the Township of Hanover. Amending and supplementing Chapter 166 of the Code of the Township, entitled Land Use and Development Legislation, by amending the regulations for the WC Whippany Center Zone District, be passed on final reading, and that a notice of the final passage of the ordinance be published in the December 20th issue of the Daily Record. May we have a motion for adoption? So moved. So moved by Mr. Fermasca. Second. Seconded by Mr. Gallagher. A roll call for adoption. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Fermasca. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Capola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. So adopted. Okay, well, <clears throat> okay ladies and gentlemen, now we continue with uh, the second of six ordinances. And this is docketed as ordinance number 25-2017 on your agenda. We have the proof of publication that the ordinance and the notice of, a uh, notice of introduction appeared in full in the November 15th issue of the Daily Record. At this time, may we have a motion to convene the public hearing so on ordinance 25-2017. Motion by Mr. Fermasca, seconded by Mr. Gallagher. On roll call, Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Fermasca. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. Is there anyone present wishing to speak concerning Ordinance 25 2017? Motion to close. Seeing none, hearing second. none. Motion by Mr. Bruno, seconded by Mr. Uh, Coppola. On roll call to close the public hearing, Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Fermasca. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. Now on adoption, be it resolved that an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the Township Committee of the Township of Hanover in the County of Morris, the State of New Jersey, authorizing the purchase and installation of an uninterruptible power system, power supply system, 
batteries and other related improvements for the police department's 911 system and further appropriating the sum of $40,000 from the unallocated portion of the township's 2017 capital improvement fund in all prior years for the financing of the improvements be passed on final reading and that a notice of the final passage of the ordinance be published in the December 20th issue of the Daily Record. May we now have a motion on adoption. So moved. So moved by Mr. Second. Gallagher. Seconded by Mr. Faramaska and Mr. Coppola. On roll call for adoption. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramaska. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. So adopted. And ladies and gentlemen, we continue on page two of your agenda. And ordinance number 26-2017 is a mouthful, but basically it creates a new B10 zone overlay district. On ordinance 26-2017, again, this is a municipal land use uh, ordinance. Uh, the ordinance was, um, sent to all adjoining municipalities in the Morris County Planning Board. We have the notice that the uh, ordinance was received and recorded by the Morris County Office of Planning and Preservation. Uh, the um, summation of the ordinance, because this is a 34-page ordinance, uh, by law we can publish a summation uh, describing the reasons for the amendments to uh, the ordinance, along with a copy of the zone map. So the summation of the ordinance with the zone map appeared in the Thursday, November 13th issue of the Daily Record. We have also uh, on referral to the Planning Board in accordance with the Municipal Land Use Law, a letter from the Planning Board recommending the uh, adoption of ordinance 26-2017. That being said, may we now have a motion to convene the public hearing on ordinance number 26-2017. So motion by Mr. Faramaska and a second by Mr. Gallagher on roll call for the public hearing. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramaska. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. Is there anyone in chambers wishing to be heard concerning Ordinance 26-2017? Move that close. Seeing none, hearing none, we have a motion by Mr. Capola to close the public Second. hearing. Second by? Second. By Mayor Francioli. On roll call to close the public hearing. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramaska. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. Now on adoption. Be it resolved that an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the Township Committee of the Township of Hanover, amending and supplementing Chapter 166 of the Code of the Township, entitled Land Use and Development Legislation, by adding a new B-10 zone district <coughs> and regulations, adding a new B-10 zone overlay in the I Industrial District, eliminating the B-1, <coughs> BP, and IB zone district, changing the zone district, Eliminating the B1, BP, and IB zone district. Changing the zone classification of various properties in the B, B1, BP, DS, I, IB, IP, R25, and RM2 zones to the new B10 zone district. Revising the zone boundaries of the DS, I, IP, OBDS, RM2 zone districts amending the regulations pertaining to hotels and motels, amending the regulations for gasoline service stations, amending the regulations for the B, I, IB2, IP, RM2, and TC zone districts, amending the sign regulations, adding various use definitions, and amending various other provisions of Chapter 166 in order to accommodate the foregoing revisions be passed on final reading and that a notice of the final passage of the ordinance be published in the December 20th issue of the Daily Record. With that mouthful, I would ask 
for a motion for adoption. I, I will move this, so and move at the same time, Mr. I will give this a nickname. Yes. And we'll no longer refer to this as just ordinance number 26-2017. <laughs> We're going to call this what everybody's asked for, the Route 10 Corridor Master Plan, okay? Many have asked about it. The Planning Board has worked very carefully on this for four years, okay? This is, this is a big night for the Planning Board. I thank the Planning Board for its work on this. I thank the um, Township Committee for its contribution. I thank the Planner. So I am proud to introduce this motion for approval. Okay, we have a motion for adoption by Mr. Faramaska. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Francioli and Mr. Gallagher in unison. <laughs> now roll call on adoption. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramaska. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. Mr. Francioli. Aye. Now similar to the <laughs> four forthcoming tax law changes, <laughs> Mr. Francioli will sign the 34-page bill. All right. So yeah. times. Hold that up there so they can see what oh. this looks like. The that mini master plan for Route 10. There you go. It's, Ron, for, I would, uh, it, it's for real. There you go, folks. Thank you it's guys. happening. Ron, I would also like to thank the planning board. I'd like to thank you guys, too, on the planning board for all of this great work. It's absolutely, uh, you know, Chris Christie took the term toolbox and I don't agree with the way he used it, but this is an incredible tool for our town, and I think it addresses a lot of issues, so I, I know what went into it, and thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Great work. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Gene. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll proceed now with Ordinance 27-2017. We have the proof of publication that the ordinance and the notice of introduction appeared in full in the November 28th, 2017 issue of the Daily Record. So on ordinance number 27-2017, may we have a motion to convene the public hearing. So, so second. moved by Mr. Coppola, seconded by Mr. Bruno. On roll call to convene the public hearing, Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramaska. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli, Aye. is there anyone present wishing to speak concerning ordinance number 27-2017? Seeing none, hearing none, may we have a motion to close the public hearing. So moved by Mr. Pola, seconded by Mr. Faramaska. Roll call to close the public hearing. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramaska. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. And now on adoption, be it resolved that an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the Township Committee of the Township of Hanover, authorizing the furnishing and installation of two pedestrian gates and other related improvements by the Marstown and Erie Railway for the pedestrian at grade rail crossing at the intersection of the westerly side of South Jefferson Road and the Marstown and Erie Railway main line and further appropriating the sum of $30,000 from the unallocated portion of the Township's 2017 Capital Improvement Fund and all prior years for the financing of the improvements described herein be passed on final reading and that a notice of the final passage of the ordinance be published in the December 20th issue of the Delhi Record in accordance with law. May we now have a motion on adoption. So moved. so moved by Mr. Coppola, seconded by Mr. Francioli. Roll call on adoption. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramaska. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. So adopted. Continuing again on page two of your agenda, ordinance number 28-2017. We have the proof of publication that the ordinance and the notice of introduction appeared in full in the November 28th issue of the Daily Record in accordance with law. May we now have a motion to convene the public hearing. So moved. So moved second. by Mr. Bruno, seconded by Mr. Gallagher. On roll call to convene the public hearing, Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramaska. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. Is there anyone in chambers wishing to be heard concerning ordinance number 28-2017?
Close. Seeing none, hearing none, Second. we have a motion by Mr. Capola to close the public hearing. Seconded by Mr. Bruno. Roll call to close the public hearing. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Ferramosca. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Capola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. Now on adoption, be it resolved that an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the Township Committee of the Township of Hanover, amending and supplementing section 255-7, entitled Rate Schedule, under Chapter 255 of, the Code, 255 of the Code of the Township, entitled Towing and Road Service, as it relates to towing and road service charges for calendar years 2018 and 19, be passed on final reading, and that the notice of the final passage of the ordinance be published in the December 20th issue of the Daily Record. May we now have a motion for adoption. So moved. So moved by Mr. Second. Bruno, seconded by Mr. Gallagher. On the roll call for adoption, Mr. Gallagher, Aye. Mr. Faramosca, Aye. Mr. Bruno, Aye. Mr. Capola, Aye. and Mr. Francioli. Aye. So adopted. And the final ordinance for public hearing, ladies and gentlemen, is docketed as Ordinance 29 2017. We have the proof of publication that the ordinance and the notice of introduction appeared in full in the November 28th issue of the Daily Record. May we now have a motion to convene the public so hearing? Moved. So moved by Mr. Faramosca. Second. Second by Mr. Gallagher. On roll call for public hearing. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramosca. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye again. Is there anyone present wishing to be heard concerning Ordinance 29-2017? Okay, seeing none, hearing none, may we have a motion, motion to close, close the public hearing? I will move that to close. We have a motion by Mr. Faramosca to close the public hearing. Second. Second by Mr. Bruno. On roll call to close the public hearing, Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramosca. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. Now on adoption, be it resolved that an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the Township Committee of the Township of Hanover, establishing a new Article 4 entitled college internship program under chapter 61 of the code of the township entitled salaries and compensation personnel policies be passed on final reading and that a notice of the final passage of the ordinance be published in the December 20th issue of the daily record in accordance with law may we now have a motion on adoption I will move this this is a fantastic opportunity for our college students within Hanover Township it lays the groundwork for them to participate in meaningful intern experiences within government functions. We have committee man Faramaska on motion for adoption. Second. Second by Mr. Gallagher and Mr. Francioli. Mm -hmm. Roll call for adoption. Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramaska. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Capola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. And that is adopted unanimously and that concludes the public hearing portion on the consideration of adoption of ordinances we continue to page three and page four and five you have a listing of 19 resolutions for uh, approval are there any questions from members of the township committee concerning any of the resolutions Joe can I just ask that George um George's public safety, police and fire. And if George, if you would just like to um, explain to the public a little bit about Drive Sober and Get Pulled Over. Yeah, well, that's a grant program. And because of the townships, the, the police department statistics, you know, not everybody can get that grant. You have to show that you're aggressive and that you're looking out for the, for the residents who are, or anyone who's driving while impaired. Um, this thing begins at this point in time and goes through portions of January. This allows them to have additional people, monies to pay the additional people over time or whatever it takes to uh, enforce this uh, uh, resolution that's on page on this uh, agenda tonight. I will, I, this was part of what I was going to speak about um, later on. Uh, but it's a very important, okay, because we all know that, you know, if you, read a, if you read a police report, 
that we receive periodically, if not every week. A lot of times they're caught, not because they're drinking while they're being seen drinking, but because something else happens and the police officer, you know, uh, finds out from smell that something's kind of funny. I mean, I got Patrol McQuinn over there. I'm sure he could tell you that. <laughs> but I think it's so important when you, re when you read about how these people get killed because someone went out, drank, and didn't have the good sense to call an Uber care or something and just decided to drive home. You might get away with it once, twice, whatever. Eventually, sometimes things can happen and you can regret it the rest of your life. So, you know, I just ask that everyone be aware of it, okay? And just remember, there is extra patrol that's going on now. So, enjoy the holidays, but be safe. Mm. Any uh, questions from members of the governing body concerning any other resolution? Motion moved. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Francioli, second, uh, <coughs> second by Mr. Farmaska the, for the approval of consent. Which is the consumption? Is that the one to serve alcohol? Which one are you talking about, Shop George? Right? No, ShopRite is not on here. No. Oh, okay. No. These have to do with uh, inactive licenses for Whippany Village and also for um, the license which is owned by the um, Hanover Crossing uh, developer. They have to, because they're inactive licenses, they have to file for a special ruling in order to continue the license. Okay, we have a motion uh, and second, second for uh, approval of the consent agenda. And now on uh, the vote, Mr. Gallagher? Aye. Mr. Faramaska? Aye. Mr. Bruno? Aye. Mr. Coppola? Yes. And Mr. Francioli? Aye. And we have payment of bills, $8,995,786.74. <coughs> motion to pay the bill. We have a motion by Mr. Second. Bruno, seconded by Mr. Gallagher. On roll call, Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Faramaska. Aye. Mr. Bruno. Aye. Mr. Coppola. Aye. And Mr. Francioli. Aye. We'll pay our bills. Two raffle applications as a consent agenda. May we have a motion? So moved. So moved by Mr. Coppola. Second. Second by Mr. Bruno. On roll call, Mr. Gallagher? Aye. Mr. Fermosca? Aye. Mr. Bruno? Aye. Mr. Coppola? Aye. And Mr. Francioli? Aye. And that clears the Business Administrator Township Clerk's agenda, and I thank you, Mayor, and members of the Township Committee. Thank you, Joe, very much. That's thank very you. Long and uh, long involved agenda. agenda tonight. Yes. Uh, but we got a lot of good work done, so we're happy yeah, with that. Uh, once again, gentlemen, a motion to open the floor. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor again is open. If anyone would like to address the Township Committee, please do so from the podium once again, giving us your name and address for the record. Seeing none. Hearing none. Motion to close. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Gentlemen. Mr. Gallagher. Ron will be as quick as possible because I know we have a lot more work to do tonight. Oh, we do. But I would just like to say, uh, as far as our DPW is concerned, last Saturday they began the day by picking up leaves. They went right back to the garage. They took off some of that equipment and put on the last part of their mechanism for salting. They went out and they were salting. And at the end of the day, they put the blades on and they were scraping where is necessary. Uh, they went out last night. Brian Fran and I were talking at 2 o'clock in the morning. They did a phenomenal job of salting and pushing where they have to push. So when you see the guys out there, trust me, they're taking care of business. When most of us are sleeping, they're out there working so we can get out and have a nice have a nice blacktop in Hanover Township. My mm -hmm. wife always comments there's blacktop in Hanover Township. They, yeah, absolutely <coughs> record job this year. They, they um, are leaf really collection good. On, on the snow work, it's an absolutely record job. Uh, um, the other thing that I'd like to comment on is they went above and beyond this year, too, with their Christmas decorations. I can't tell you how many people tell me how wonderful Town Hall looks. I'd like to say that I did it. I'd like to say that we did it. But we support our men and our, our women and our employees, and they do a beautiful job. And it's just another example on um, what happens when you get together as a team and you have a lot of pride and, and love for your community. These guys are fantastic. Look good. Uh, as far as uh, Substance Awareness Council and Mars Area Coalition for Education and Positive Choices, once again, we're coming up on our winter schedule. We have 10 consecutive Friday nights at Menin Arena. We have special events for every one of those nights. Also, um, the third and fourth Saturday in January, we're going to have at Retro Fitness, uh, Fitness Training with Hanover Township PD. 
the third and fourth Saturday in February at Cheer Pride, where I've been uh, trained with the firefighters. The second Saturday of January, February, or March, we're having a team night at Cheer Pride. They stepped into our coalition. Our kids are going to be busy. And the most important thing we have coming up this winter, and we are the first ones to do it, and that's right from the prosecutor's office, is with Hanover Township PD, with the prosecutor's office, Substance Awareness Council, and the Sheriff's Department, we're having a master class on vaping. Everybody's interested and curious about vaping. It's the biggest fad. You can use that transportation device or transport device to take, take almost any drug nowadays. A lot of parents are asking about it, and I talked to uh, Ron and I went to a Crime Stoppers event, and mm -hmm. Brad Seabury told me the calls are off, the phones off the wall with people asking about it. We're having our first big class right here. We're going to talk about vaping marijuana, alcohol, and then the prosecutor's office is going to go right into opiates and heroin. So that's going to be Tuesday night, February 12th at Memorial Junior School. I, I would like as many people to attend as possible because all of us with school-aged children and grandchildren, uh, we want to get in front of it, anything we can to protect our kids and form that front line. Ron, that's it. That's Absolutely. Very good. Thank you, Ace. John? Under the title of Great Things Happen in Hanover, Planning Board, great things happen here tonight in terms of the re-exam of the master plan as well as the uh, initiation of the Route 10 corridor, which will facilitate um, redevelopment activity uh, on Route 10. Um, EDAC held its Making Connections event. It was held off-premises. We were invited to hold it at a retailer. Uh, Wegmans invited us there. We held it on December 1st. It was a great success, great opportunity for networking for businesses of all sizes within Hanover Township. I'd like to thank the Township Committee and Mr. Giorgio for their support in initiating the Young Adults Internship Program. This is a big initiative for our, our college-age students, uh, offering them municipal internships. And this is something that I think will provide them a great opportunity to get experience in either finance or administration or engineering or recreation. So thanks again for your help with that. And lastly, we heard from the water company tonight, and it's kind of like something we got to do. If you haven't signed up for Everbridge Emergency Notification System, please sign up for it. It's easy. It's on the township website. And John, just to make comment, I think we have right now about 3,000 people that have signed up for Urban Bridge. 3,000, that's, 3, that's significant. Yeah. That, that's great. Thank well, I thank you. the 3,000 who have taken the first step, and if yeah. you haven't, please join the group. Hopefully that's heads of household. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. Hope so. Very good, very good. Georgie. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, you got the information on that for public safety on DWI. Uh, Landmark Commission is really kind of working pretty hard to get the hedge line uh, completed over at the um, burial yard. Once that's done, it's really going to be a pretty neat looking facility, so kind of block all of the, you know, sort of a live fence that eventually will help to preserve the, the gravestones and, and keep the noise factor down. Cultural arts are just winding down for the, for the year, so between them and the seniors, uh, they're getting ready for the new year. Veterans Alliance, they did have the um, Pearl Harbor Day on December 7th. Um, other than that, they, they themselves are, you know, just winding down and getting ready for the new year. So. Thanks, George. A couple things. Yeah, the um, football team, the fifth and sixth grade football team we had in a couple of weeks ago did, in fact, advance to the national championships. Oh, wow. And they'll be playing tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock of all the godforsaken times um, out in Ohio against a team from Pittsburgh. I think it'll be streaming on Facebook. Bert Dean is going to be out there streaming on Facebook. Those are who are technologically savvy can probably figure out a way to look it up. Um, but we, uh, we want to wish them the best of luck. In Go their, Tigers. Go yeah. Tigers in their quest for a national title. We hope they can bring that home to Hanover Township. Uh, we had the Santa Claus is Coming to Town event on uh, December 2nd. It was a tremendous, really a tremendous turnout, over 250 families, um, more kids than ever. There must be a lot, of, uh, a lot of young families moving into town, which is great to see. 
Uh, everybody got to visit with Santa Claus, which of course was the highlight. We were assisted by our fire department, and we certainly thank them for transporting Santa safely and soundly in one piece. Um, the winter sports are underway, basketball, wrestling, ski trips. Check out the rec center if you have any questions or want to get registered. Um, and then the last reminder, the chili cook-off, February 2nd, which I believe is the Friday of Super Bowl weekend. If you have anyone who has a great chili recipe or if you yourself have a great chili recipe, please call the rec center and, uh, and get registered. Um, the first one took place last year. It was a great event. I think this year will be great as well. That was great. That's it for me. That chili it was good. was great. Yeah. We, all, we all got a chance to judge it, so that's what's even better. Oh, one other thing. I do <laughs> want to thank our administrator, Mr. Giorgio. Um, I, I counted about 20 meetings so far this year, and we passed 23 ordinances. Uh, tonight, in one meeting, we passed six ordinances. Uh, that can only be done with uh, his skill and expertise yeah, and due diligence and all the public notifications and roll calls and everything else. So, Joe, you went above and beyond, and I really want to thank you. thank you for getting all that in before year end. Thank you. Bob, thank you know you what's both. interesting, Ron, if I may? While sure. Joe was doing that one real long one, I said there's no way this guy can ever retire. This is not a long <laughs> show. Great, great work. Thank well, you, too. Absolutely. Thank you. We, great we, job. we talked him away from it from now. So. For the time being. <laughs> for, the, for the time being, we talked him away from it, Ace, so we, so we got him for a while. <laughs> that's, that's good. Very good. Uh, listen, I want to congratulate uh, our fellow committeemen. I want to congratulate Mr. Coppola because next week, uh, Mr. Coppola will be sworn in as the next president of the Hanover Township Senior Citizens Club. So I think that's going to be great, and I know you're going to do a hell of a job. That, that's for sure. You know, very, very good. Uh, as a township committee, we want to wish everyone a season's greetings, a very happy Hanukkah in your house, your family. Uh, all the best of uh, the seasons, all the good tidings of the seasons to everyone. Uh, really enjoy yourself. Be safe, as George says. Uh, enjoy yourself, but watch how much enjoyment you take. So go from there. Uh, on that note, uh, uh, motion for adjourn. So moved. So moved. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Gentlemen, we are adjourned. We have lots of work to do. Lots of work. Order the pizza now. You better order the pizza, Joe. Okay. <laughs> We got EDAC in the morning. How's it to stay here? Sleeping quarters? You know what? You better.